Suppose we have a test tube and inside that test tube we have a bunch of cells. Now we take those cells and we grind those cells down so that we break the cell membrane and we basically expose all the component structures and biological molecules found inside the cell. So now we have a homogenous mixture that consists of all these different types of things like the cell nuclei, mitochondria and other organelles, ribosomes, proteins and so forth mixed in into our test tube. Now, if we take the test tube and we place it inside a centrifuge, a process known as centrifugation takes place. And centrifugation is this process by which we use angular motion. We basically accelerate our test tube to very high rotational speeds. And what this allows us to do is it basically allows us to separate the different components inside our homogenous mixture based on things like mass, density, size, and shape, as we'll see in just a moment. But first, let's actually discuss briefly the physics behind the process of centrifugation. Let's see how it actually works. So let's suppose we take our test tube and we place it inside our centrifuge and it begins to rotate in the counterclockwise direction. So basically in this direction as shown. So this is position one and sometime T afterwards, this is position two. Now let's suppose this is the particle shown in blue that we are studying inside our uh, homogeneous mixture. And so this is the particle that we basically want to discuss and we want to basically answer the following question. What forces are acting on that particle? Well, first of all, because this test tube is being rotated in a circular motion, what that means is we know from physics this particle will have a certain tangential velocity and the velocity here, the vector will point tangent with respect to the circle. So this is why the velocity basically points this way for this particular particle. Now, even though the tangential velocity points this way, because this particle is, a, is suspended inside a fluid, that fluid will create a force, will exert a force on that particle and this is the force that creates the centripetal acceleration of that object of the particle that makes it move in a nearly circular fashion. Now the reason the particle doesn't actually move in a perfect circle is because the particle has inertia and because of the inertia of that particle that will create a slight motion that will uh, that will point outward and so if we follow a perfect circle from position one to position two, this is where that particle should technically end up. But because of the inertia of our object of that particle, that inertia will resist that force and so it will push it slightly outward and so instead of being here, that particle will be located here. And as our uh, object rotates, this particle basically keeps on moving outward. And the density, the mass, the shape, and the size of the particle basically determines the rate at which it moves outward, as we'll see in just a moment. So said another way, we can imagine that there's this force known as the centrifugal force that points outward, and it's that force that causes it to move outward along our test tube. So we have this force due to the uh, fluid, let's say force resistance, that basically acts on that object and it causes it to move this way. And so that is what creates that centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. And so we have this other force known as the force centrifugal that basically causes it to move in the other direction. In fact, that's why this process is known as centrifugation because it's the result of this centrifugal force. Now, the next question is, how exactly do we describe the rate at which different particles move inside our rotating test tube during the process of centrifugation? So in biochemistry, we describe the rate of the movement of the particles inside our test tube by using a quantity known as the sedimentation coefficient, and that is given with the lowercase s. 
So lowercase s is equal to the mass of that particle multiplied by 1 minus v bar multiplied by rho divided by f. Now in the next lecture we're going to use physics to basically derive this equation. Now let's discuss what these quantities actually mean. So S is our sedimentation coefficient and it is given in units known as Svedberg units. Now M is the mass of that particular particle that we are examining. In this particular case, the mass is the mass of this blue biological particle. Now V bar is known as the partial specific volume and more specifically it's the reciprocal of the density of that particle. So V bar is equal to 1 divided by the density of that particle. Now this row is basically the density of our medium and F is basically the frictional coefficient of that particle and this has to do with the shape of that particle. So the more spherical our particle is, the lower the value of F is and the less spherical that particle is, the higher the value of F is. So we see that the higher the S is, the higher the sedimentation coefficient is, the higher the sedimentation speed is, and that means the faster that particle will move along and down that test tube. And by down, we mean towards this end of our test tube and not towards this end. Now, let's take a look at the following equation and let's try to see what this equation actually tells us with respect to how th these different types of factors actually influence the sedimentation speed and the sedimentation coefficient of our particle. So from this equation, we obtain four important principles. Number one, the greater the mass of that particle is, the greater the sedimentation coefficient is and the greater the sedimentation speed is. So if we are examining two particles, let's say the blue particle A and the green particle B, if these particles have the same shape, have the same size, have the same density, but they have different masses, the mass that is greater will basically move with a higher sedimentation coefficient, so we'll have a higher sedimentation speed. So if the mass of the blue particle is greater than the mass of the green particle, but the size and shape is the same, then the higher mass travels down a test tube more rapidly, and that can be seen from the following diagram, because if everything is kept constant, but the mass is increased, this S value will increase, and we know the higher this S value is, the faster the move of the particle along that test tube is. Now, let's move on to principle number two. The shape of the particle also affects the sedimentation speed. Now, from these different quantities, which one describes the shape of the particle? Well, this describes the shape of the particle. The F, the frictional coefficient of the particle, basically is related to its shape. And we said earlier that the more spherical our particle is, the lower the F value is, and if the F value is lowered and everything else is kept the same, then what that means is if our denominator is lower but the numerator is kept constant, then the S value will increase. And so the more spherical our particle is, the higher our sedimentation speed is. So more spherical particles have lower frictional coefficient values F than less spherical particles of equal mass. So what equal mass is, uh, means, we're basically keeping all these other constants, all these other quantities constant, but we're changing the F value. So therefore, more spherical particles move more rapidly than less spherical particles do. And so in a following diagram, if these two masses, let's say the blue mass is mass A and the green mass is mass B, if they have the same exact masses, but this one is more spherical and this one is more elongated, then the spherical one will travel down the test tube with a greater sedimentation rate, with a, with a greater sedimentation speed. Now, number three, 
a more dense particle moves quicker than a less dense particle. So remember, the density of our particle in this equation is basically given by the V bar, so the partial specific volume. The partial specific volume is equal to one divided by the density of that particle. So if the density of that particle increases, then this fraction decreases, and so V bar decreases. If V bar decreases, this quantity decreases, and this numerator gets larger. And what that means is, if the numerator gets larger, the S value increases, and if the S value is greater, that means that particle will move faster. So a denser particle moves faster than a less denser particle because it experiences a smaller resistive force. Now let's move on to four. Density of the fluid also affects the sedimentation speed. So the fluid is basically that fluid that is found inside our homogenous mixture. So we have all of these different types of particles that basically are floating around inside that fluid and the fluid has its own density. Now let's take a look at the following value. So the question is, what exactly is the product of V bar and rho? So rho is the density of that medium, that fluid, and V bar is basically one divided by the density of the particle. So this is equal to, so let's call this rho the density of the fluid divided by, so this is the density of the fluid, and this V bar is basically one divided by the density of the particle, so multiplied by one divided by the density of the particle, which is equal to this right over here. So th we, we see that this product is simply the ratio of the densities of the fluid to our particle. Now, if the density of the fluid is equal to the density of the particle, then this ratio is simply equal to 1. And if this ratio is equal to 1, then that means if the density of those two particles is the same, uh, if the density of the particle is the same as the density of the fluid, that fluid and that particle will not move with respect to one another. So if this ratio is equal to one, that particle will not move inside the fluid because their densities are equal. So remember from physics we know that an object will float or an object will sink and that depends on the density of that object with respect to the density of that fluid. Now, if the product of V bar and rho is greater than 1, then that means the fluid has a higher density than that particle, and so that particle will float on top of that fluid. So if this is true, the particle will float, and in that particular case, a 1 minus a value that is greater than 1 will give us a negative quantity, and so this value will be a negative value. So if we get a negative value for our sedimentation coefficient, that means means that particle essentially floats on top of our fluid, it will not travel through the fluid. On the other hand, if the product of V and rho, V bar and rho is uh, less than one, what that means is the density of the particle will be greater than the density of the fluid, and so our object, the particle, will sink in the fluid. And that means that it will travel down along the fluid and to the end of that test tube. And if we look at this equation, if this quantity is, gr uh, if this quantity is less than one, then one minus a value less than one is a positive quantity. That means that S value, the sedimentation coefficient, will in fact be a positive value. So a positive sedimentation coefficient means it will move through that fluid, while a negative means it will float on that fluid. And if this is zero, that means it will not move inside that fluid. So this is the equation that we use to basically describe the rate of movement of particles inside our centrifuge when the process of centrifugation is taking place. And in the next lecture, we're going to see where this equation actually comes from.